Please be seated. It's wonderful, even if we can't seem to be able to respond to truth. And uh, we're going to continue to do that by reading God's Word together now. Uh, there are two Bible readings uh, this evening. The first is John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 8. So John's Gospel, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Uh, the words will be on the screen. Um, uh, but if you're at home, uh, do uh, find a Bible. And if you uh, have come this evening, uh, do a scroll on your phones. Or if you brought a Bible with you, wonderful. Uh, John chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 uh, to 8. Hear the word of God. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Our second reading is from Ezekiel at chapter 36. And we're going to read verses 22 to 32. Ezekiel 36, verses 22 to 32. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel." This is God's word. Well, on Sunday evenings, we're in a series uh, looking at 
uh, the Bible in 10 words. And the idea is that uh, over 10 weeks and uh, through 10 words, we will get a view of the whole of Scripture. And uh, so far, we have had six weeks, and uh, each title begins with C. And so we've looked at creation and the beginning of Genesis. Then we looked at the curse and the fall of Adam and Eve. Then we looked at covenant and God's promise to Abraham to be his God and Abraham to be his man. Then we looked at community and how God uh, raised up a community of people, the Israelites, who came from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Then we looked at crown and we saw that God uh, appointed a king for his community and that king was David and his descendants. And then last week we looked at captives and the fact that because God's people, the Israelites, rebelled against God and disobeyed God, he sent them out of the land that he promised to give them and sent them into exile, into Babylon. This week the title is Cleansed and we're looking basically at the return of God's people from exile, the return into the land. That's what Ezekiel talks about here in chapter 36. He's talking about the people returning to the land and becoming God's people once again. But these words in Ezekiel 36 are not just pointing to God's people returning to the land. They're doing more than that. These verses here bridge, are a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they point to the ultimate return from exile, the ultimate cleansing that God's people will enjoy in the new covenant. A bit of background here in, uh, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was preaching in the 6th century BC. Um, he was preaching in Babylon. He was one of the exiles who'd been taken to Babylon after the city of Jerusalem was sacked, first of all in 596 BC and then again in 586 BC. He's taken captive to Babylon and uh, along with lots of other exiles and they're there because of disobedience. They've turned away from God. Um, you see, God gave the Israelites the land of Canaan because the Canaanites were being disobedient. We should be with the microphone. Okay. Is that better for the stream? I think everyone could hear already, could they? Hear. Sorry for those of you at home who saw my mouth moving and heard no words coming out. Okay, we're working. Uh, do I need to summarize everything for people at home? Okay. Sorry, people at home, it was glitchy. Hopefully it won't be anymore. Uh, what am I saying, what am I saying? I've lost my whole train of thought now. Ezekiel. We're looking at the book of Ezekiel. And we're in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel's preaching in the 6th century BC. Uh, he's been exiled to Babylon along with many other Israelites uh, because they disobeyed God. Um, and he's, Ezekiel here says God is going to bring the Israelites back to the land. And he does that. He did that. Uh, and uh, uh, prophets like Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi at the end of the Old Testament, they preach to the people to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, and rebuild the people of God. Now, I was saying that these verses point forward to the New Testament, uh, to the ultimate return from exile, which we receive through Jesus Christ. See, these verses don't just point to the return from exile back in the 6th century and the cleansing that God offered then, but these verses point forward to the ultimate return from exile, the exile from captivity to sin and the cleansing from sin 
which is ours in Jesus Christ. See, these verses are all about God cleansing and restoring and renewing his people, giving them new hearts and new spirits. This is how the Old Testament ends. I know this is the middle of Ezekiel and there's a few more prophets to come, but actually he's preaching in exile and he's speaking about the people post-exile. The Old Testament ends on a word of hope, an expectation that God is going to act in grace to cleanse and renew and restore and regather his people. And we experience the fullness of that in Jesus Christ. And if you want to know that in your own life, if you want to know God's cleansing grace, then there's three things about God's grace and renewal that you need to know. First of all, why does God act in grace? How does God act in grace? And how should you respond to that grace that God gives? So why does God act in grace? How does God act in grace? And how should you respond to it? And Ezekiel shows us all those three things. So first of all, why does God act in grace? Uh, have you ever asked that question? Why does God act in mercy and in grace? Well, this, this passage says it's not because he's merciful and gracious, although he is. Or let's put it another way. Why does God save sinful people by his grace? It's not because he loves us, although he does. This passage tells us something much more profound. Ezekiel says this in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. It's not because I love you. It's not because I'm gracious and merciful towards you, and I'm gracious and merciful generally. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of of my great name which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them and the nations will know that I am the Lord why does God act in grace for the sake of his name for his glory Isaiah says similar things. It's for my own sake, for my own sake that I will do these things. See, God's name or his glory, that's what's preeminent to God. That's what's most important to God. What's his name? What's his glory? Well, his glory is the display of his attributes. His name and his glory is the display of who he is. So, what is God? Well, God is good and true and faithful and holy and powerful and wise. And so God saves people by his grace to display those things. To display how good he is. To display how powerful he is. To display how wise he is in being able to come up with a way of salvation that is based on grace. God acts in grace to display these things. God's name in the Old Testament was connected to the Israelites. He was their God. They were his people. And so they represented him on earth. I suppose the closest illustration we uh, get today, uh, well, one illustration would be at children in a family. Before lockdown, I uh, went to a parents' evening uh, at uh, our boys' school. And I do find that parents' evening, parents' evenings are not just a judgment on my child's 
how my child's doing at school, I do find there a little bit of a judgment on how I'm doing as a parent. So if the, 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 the teachers of the parents' evening are saying, oh yes, we love having this child in my class, um, you know, he's doing extremely well at school, you know, it's, it's, there's a bit of pride, you know, pride going on there. I'm like quite pleased. And then if, uh, if they say, well, actually, I oh, really don't like having him in class. He's, he's really hard work and he's really struggling. I'm like, oh. Because in some sense, they represent me and there's a connection between them and me. On a bigger scale, you see that with sports teams. And then when England won the cricket yesterday, didn't we do well? There are representatives. Well, the Israelites were God's representatives. And so when the Israelites were doing badly, when they were acting in an ungodly manner, when they were treating each other badly, when they were worshipping idols, when they were sacrificing their children to those idols and doing awful things to one another, then God's name was dishonoured. God's name, as Ezekiel says, was profaned among the nations. In other words, the other nations looked on and were like, wow, is that how they act? And so they lost the land, they went into exile as a result. But God's name wasn't just dishonoured amongst the Israelites, but was also dishonoured by the other nations because of the exile. You see, back then, nations saw wars and fights as battles between gods. So if you were a nation in the Middle East and you had a particular god, say a god called Marduk, which was one of the gods at the time, and they defeated another god, you would say, well, our god's better than your god. And so when the Israelites lost the battle with the Babylonians and were taken into exile, what did people say? Well, people said, your God's not very powerful. He couldn't help you out. Or your God's not very good. He didn't want to help you out. And so, God's name was dishonoured. Dishonoured among all the nations. And so God... Ezekiel says, had to act. He had to do something for the sake of his name. His glory was at stake. People were dishonoring God and saying, look, he's not powerful. He's not good. He's not holy. And that's why he does what he does. And he does it by restoring the Israelites, bringing them back from exile. It's through the Israelites that God will restore the honour of his name. That's what he says at the end of verse 23. Through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. That is the eyes of the nations. When the world looks on and sees the lives of the Israelites transformed in holiness, then his name is held in honour once again. We see that in testimonies in our community, in our church. When people become Christians and they say, you know, look at the way God's transformed my life. My life was a real mess. I used to be an alcoholic and, and God picked me up out of the dirt and, and out of the addiction and cleaned my life up and restored me. Praise and honour to God. And when someone says, you know, I just lived this awful life, just ignoring God, treating people badly. And then God brought me down and, and God raised me up once again. And he's made me love other people. And be kind to people who previously I would have hit. God's honoured when that happens. 
And that's why God saves. That's why God acts in grace. You see, God acts in grace. God saves people, not because he loves them, though he does, but for the sake of his name, for the sake of his glory, so he can be honored. And that gives us, as Christians, a really a sure foundation for our faith. Because our faith is not based on whether God likes you or not. Our faith is based on the glory and honor of his name. He has to save us. He has to work in our lives. Because otherwise he will not be honored. And that's what he wants more than anything else. And when we pray for people to become Christians, we should pray, God, please save this person, not so because you love them, but because we want your name to be hallowed and your kingdom to come. And that will only happen if you change people's lives. And do you know as Christians, as you live your life, you honor or dishonor the name of God, depending on how you live. If you are seeking to live in a godly way, you will honor his name. If, like the Israelites had, turned away from God and lived for other things, you'll dishonor the name of God. But the thing that God wants from you, from me, more than anything else, is for his name to be honored in our lives. That's why God acts in grace, for the sake of his name. And so the second question is this, how does God act in grace? What does it mean to say that God acts in grace? What's he do? Well, he acts in grace by transforming people's lives. Do you see this flow of, uh, of I will verbs in the passage? We're going to look at each one in detail, but, but when do we say I will in life? We say it at a marriage ceremony. See, God is so committed to his people, so committed to his, his bride, that he wants, he doesn't want to leave us in our sin, but he wants to transform our lives and make us beautiful in his sight. He's committed to us. And that commitment results in a regathering of his people and a renewing of his people. First of all, it, it, it's a regathering. Do you see this in verse 24? Well, the I wills. I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the countries. And I will bring you into your own land. See, the Israelites were scattered because of their sin. That's what sin does breaks relationships down, scatters people from each other. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. And God says, that is why you've been scattered, because of your sin, but I'm not going to leave you like that. I want to gather you back in from all the nations to which you've been scattered, primarily Babylon, but other nations as well. That's what God is at work doing in our world now. Gathering his people from every nation and tribe and tongue, as we sung about earlier. Gathering his elect and chosen people together again. But transformation isn't just a regathering, it's also a renewal. A personal, internal renewal. And there's three dimensions to this renewal. If you want to experience this renewal, this is what needs to happen in your life. You need a deep clean, a new heart, and a new spirit. First of all, you need a deep clean. God says this in verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. I will cleanse you, God says. Three times he says, I want you to be clean. I want you to be clean. I want you to be clean. This is wholesale cleansing from sin. Someone said when I asked them about their experience of church, I said, I said you've been to church now a few weeks. I said, I said, what's your experience of it? How do you feel about church? And their response was, 
He makes me feel clean. I, I, I was surprised when I first heard that, but I shouldn't have been, because that should be our experience of God. Our experience of God is that uh, when we come into worship, when we worship him, is that, he, is that we feel cleansed. You see, uncleannesses, according to Ezekiel, are connected to idols. I will sprinkle you clean. I'll sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. You see, idolatry and dirt go together. When you give yourself to an idol, when you worship an idol, the Bible says, well, you're, you're falling down in the dirt before something that is created. You're getting your face in the muck. You're becoming dirty. Whether that is an idol of money, or an idol of sex, and relationships, or, or an idol of power and success and career, it doesn't matter what the idol is, it makes you unclean, makes you dirty. And when you see that you're unclean and dirty, it makes you feel ashamed. Well, God doesn't want us to be like that. God wants us for himself. He wants us to be a clean and a pure and a spotless bride who is committed to him just as he's committed to us. And so he works to cleanse our hearts. And if you come to him, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter who you are, if you come to him, he, that's what he will do. He will cleanse you from your sin. This is what 1 John says. He says, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will cleanses from all unrighteousness. The first part of any renewal is a deep clean of your heart. The second, actually, is a completely new heart. First is a deep clean of your life. The second is a new heart, a heart transplant. Ezekiel says this, I will give you a new heart. In verse 26, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Trying to live a good life is not good enough. Trying to sort out your behavior is not enough. God says sin comes from the heart. Jesus said that himself in Mark chapter 7 and in Matthew chapter 15. <laughs> And he said to the Pharisees who were complaining about his disciples not having washed their hands after gone, going shopping at the market, Jesus said, it's, what, it's not what comes into your body that makes you unclean, but what comes from your heart. Uncleanness and sin comes from your heart. And so changing your behavior and washing your hands is not going to change your life. The only thing that will, will be a heart transplant. And only God can do that. And the wonderful news is God says, I will do that. I will give you a new heart. I will take out your old stony hard heart, calloused heart, and put in a new heart, a fresh heart, a pure heart. I still remember a number of years ago when Keith gave his testimony at the front of church and it was really powerful how he said that he'd come back to church on Easter Sunday um, and for that first year he was here at church every week he would cry and in his testimony he said to us all he said this he said those tears throughout that first year of attending church with the melting of an iceberg. And that iceberg was his heart. Maybe you've experienced that same thing. Maybe you've experienced that powerful working of God where he doesn't just clean you up 
on the inside, he actually takes out that hard heart. And you have a new fleshly, soft, tender, compassionate heart in his place. But there's a third aspect of renewal. And the third aspect is a new spirit. We heard of it in verse 26. He says it again in verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It's not enough to be clean. It's not enough just to have a new heart. We also need a new spirit. And this is a spirit which God himself gives. It's God's own spirit that he puts into us. And he does so for this reason. He wants us to keep his rules and obey his commands. And we can't do that by ourselves. And so, because we don't want to do it. So God gives us his spirit that will enable us to do what God wants us to do. You see, before we become Christians, what we want to do and what God tells us to do are the opposite things. But when we become a Christian, God's Spirit comes into our hearts and into our lives to change us so that what we want to do and what God wants us to do come together. And we're enabled to do what pleases God and also what will make us happy. You know, I've seen this in action in people's lives when somebody becomes a Christian and their life begins to change. Often it's gradual. Occasionally it's dramatic and suddenly they leave their old way of life. But often it's gradual. It's week by week and month by month. God's Spirit works convicting and changing a person so that stuff which they used to do and thought that was fine they don't want to do anymore. And stuff which they thought, this was boring, reading the Bible. Coming to church, well, I used to count the bricks on the wall. Now I love doing these things. Why? Because God's spirits are working my life. And those people who used to really annoy me, do you know, I have a kindness and a love towards them now, which I never thought possible. See, this is, this is the renewal that God promises. And these, this is the renewal that is fulfilled in the New Testament. We read about it in John chapter 3 with, in, in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus, I know you think I'm a great teacher. I know you know the rules. I know you know the Old Testament. Have you not read Ezekiel? Jesus doesn't say that in John 3, but I'm sure that's where Jesus is getting all this from. Have you not read Ezekiel? You need to be born again. It's not enough to know, know, the, know the law. It's not enough to actually try and do the law. You need to become a new person. You need to be born again. And that's only possible through me. See, it's only through Jesus Christ that these promises are ultimately fulfilled through his death on the cross in our place, taking upon himself our sins on the cross and being judged by God in our place so that as we repent of our sins, as we look to him in faith, we can be forgiven. In fact, we can be cleansed. We can have a new heart and we can have a new spirit to live for God. If you're here this evening or if you're watching online and you've never you don't know that you've never experienced what it is to be born again then come to Jesus Christ come to the cross of Jesus Christ turn from your sins repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ and ask him to change your life ask him to take out of your heart the heart of stone and to put in the heart of flesh ask him to renew you by his spirit Ask him to give you a new life. Don't come to God with your hands full of your good deeds. Come to God with empty hands, asking him to change and to transform your heart, to change and transform you from the inside out and make you clean. You see, that's how God works by his grace. He transforms 
our lives from the inside out. But finally, how do we respond to it? Well, verses 28 and 29 are a a wonderful picture of prosperity and productivity and fruitfulness. God says, you're my people. And I love my people. I, I want to care for my people. And I want to bless them. And my name is at stake in what happens to them. And so I want to do you good. I want to make your life prosper. You see, that is the natural outworking of a restored relationship with God. You know, just as football teams prosper under a great football manager, so our lives prosper when they are under the loving rule of a great God. Our lives blossom like a flower. They flourish. Now, they don't always do that in the way that we would expect. And they don't always do that in the way that we want. But they do that nonetheless. And our response to what God has done and what God is doing... Well, it's it's interesting, right at the end, in verse 32. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. How how do we respond to God's grace and uh, God's blessing in our lives? Well, first of all, through humility by acknowledging that we did not do this. That we have not saved ourselves or changed our own lives. By remembering that we are sinful people who continue to sin and who would bring guilt and shame on our lives as a result if it wasn't for God's grace. But we're not to wallow in our sin and shame as we remember it, But we're to bring it to God and thank him for his goodness and praise him for his grace because that is what honours his name. See, that's why one of the difficult things at the moment with this lockdown is that we can't sing praises to God as we would want to because the heart that has been cleansed, the heart that knows its own sin is a heart that knows that only God can change it and wants to praise and thank God for doing so. It's a heart that wants to say, praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like me his praise should sing? Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise the everlasting King. That should be our response to God's grace. See, God acts in grace so that he can get all the glory. And our response is to admit that we need God's grace and to give him glory as he gives it. This is the promise that Ezekiel gave to God's people in the Old Testament. This is the promise that is fulfilled in the New Testament. The cleansing of God. Let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are a God who saves and who changes lives. Lord, you do so for your glory. Help us to honour and glorify you in the way we live, in the way we speak, acknowledging that we are not saved by our good deeds, but by your grace. And to acknowledge that so that all the glory goes to you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.